Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar series on how to read a cancer genome. This is the first of a series of three talks given by Professor Serena nix from the University of Cambridge. A few uh, housekeeping points first of all. I think you all have all come into this talk both muted and with your cameras turned off. If not, can you please make sure that your mics are indeed muted? This is a Teams live platform, so please post your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box. And we'll be monitoring that Q&A box and then I'll be asking Serena those questions at the end. I'll be asking them as a disembodied voice, so please don't be put off that at the end. So I would uh, like to welcome and thank Professor Serena Nixaynal for coming this afternoon to both share her expertise and her time with us. Serena is an NIHR research professor at the University of Cambridge and a consultant clinical geneticist at the East of England GMSA. And Serena is truly an expert in the field of somatic, somatic cancer genomics. So we're really, really lucky to have her not just for one session, but for three sessions, really telling us about how to read the cancer genome. So thank you very much indeed, Serena, and the platform is yours. I'm really, really looking forward to the next hour or so. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for the um, very kind introduction and for the opportunity to um, to tell or share with everyone um, some of the insights that um, I've managed to gain from my time in cancer genomics. Um, so I've pitched this for sort of special registrars, as I understood this to be part of the national training program, and I've, I've sort of pitched it for registrars um, in clinical genetics perhaps with relatively limited knowledge of um, somatic cancer genetics. I've been thinking about my own sort of knowledge at the, that time. Um, so, if, you know, if you're a PhD in pathology or oncology and you've done you know, cancer genomics, this probably isn't for you if you have advanced knowledge already. I'll be trying to cover um, sort of the basic principles, the biological thinking behind cancer genomics. Um, I will cover things like principles of bioinformatics, but I won't cover individual algorithms or who uses what filter and what thresholds. I'm not going to cover that sort of stuff because that's minutiae in detail that will be a little bit variable for, from one place to the next. Um, but I w really want to communicate principles um, today. I really want you to come away with understanding some of the, the basic biological um, starting points that we use in order to be able to read a cancer genome. I will signpost clinically useful summaries regarding what you need to know to be able to interpret a whole genome sequence or a cancer genome, uh, perhaps uh, in an MDT forum, uh, so in a very pragmatic way, there'll be a little green table and symbol like so, um, and um, it will sort of highlight what the principle is and then, you know, whether it's basic knowledge, something you just need to understand or something that you actually should do. And you'll be looking out for this symbol, which is sort of a, you know, clinically useful um, item. Um, I do apologize that I'm slightly dumbing it down, uh, but you know, I, as I say, it's it's a kind of a learning point, I guess, a consolidation point, and I want it to be useful for you when you're in a hurry and where you just want to try to find the relevant information. So forgive the bossiness, I'm trying to be helpful. <laughs> so the three sessions are going to cover the basics in cancer genomics from raw sequence reads through to somatic mutations in this first section. I've been quite ambitious. I'm going to try to get through driver mutations and how you look at them, how you curate them. Um, and then in the, and whatever we cannot quite cover um, in this session, I'll cover in the second session. And then the last session is largely practical. So the first two sessions are mainly theoretical um, with those uh, uh, clinical sections highlighted, clinically useful information highlighted. And then the last session is hopefully largely practical. OK, so warm up session. Section one, basic principles about cancer and next generation sequencing. I do apologize if you know all of this already, but I just need to make sure that, that this is clear before we go on to the harder stuff. So from conception, as cells divide and accumulate mutations, every cell will have its own slightly mutated version of the original genome with which you were conceived with. At some point, one cell may acquire some sort of proliferative advantage and may at some point um, acquire a, other additional mutational or physiological abnormalities and come to dominate that compartment. Eventually, it may turn into a cancer. But the important thing to take home is that a cancer is a clonal outgrowth of the original cell, the sort of the, the final common ancestor that eventually turned into that cancer. 
it's this quality that makes it possible to see somatic mutations in cancer because otherwise all your cells, each cell has got a different set of mutations and it's because a cancer is a clonal outgrowth when we sequence the DNA, DNA of that cancer you get to see the somatic mutations in them. So that's point number one, I suspect a lot of you know that already. Point number two is that when you do cancer genome sequencing, you require two samples in general. So this is mainly for so solid tumors. It is also applies for hematological um, samples. You might use an alternative for a normal, but for a solid tumor, you basically take the DNA from the tumor and then you take a blood sample, usually as a proxy of the germline. So two independent samples. You're going to blast each of those samples to gazillions of bits. You're going to do a size selection step um, in my day, it was 500, sometimes it's 400, sometimes it's 600. That actually doesn't really matter. The principle is there is a size selection step. And in that strip, there will be enough DNA to be able to sequence the genome over recurrently. And each base in the genome will be sequenced at least 30 times, sometimes 100 times, sometimes 200 times. That's what fold coverage means. We'll also be sequencing from each of those fragments, just um, the ends of the fragments. And that's why it's called a paired end next generation high, high coverage sequencing. So this is the general principle. You've got a fragment, you're sequencing either end. The length of the fragment may vary. The length of the sequence may vary. It may be 100 base pairs, it may be 150, but you will have a fragment size and you will have the end sequence and you should have a gap in the middle. So in this case, for a 500 base pair fragment, you'll have a 300 base pair uh, gap in the middle. Okay, again, that's a basic principle. There'll be variations of this theme. Third point to make is that you'll have your reads um, from the tumor and from the normal. You will align them back to the reference human genome. And then you will call all the differences between your tumor sample and your normal sample relative to that reference genome and subtract all the germline variation. So all the purple crosses are germline variants in this schematic and the red um, you the red crosses represent somatic or acquired mutations and it might seem weird in clinical genetics, but in somatic cancer genetics, we are interested in the acquired mutations. Um, we don't just throw away all the um, germline information. We do use it. Today I'm going to focus on all the red stuff. OK, so somatic acquired mutations require the subtraction of germline variation. I'm only going to show one slide on this, just essentially to acknowledge the fact that there are multiple different kinds of sequencing strategies. There's whole genome sequencing, exome sequencing, and targeted panel sequencing. They, you know, they do different amounts of the whole genome, and this is just a schematic of of what uh, parts of the genome are actually sequenced. There tends to be differences in the fold coverage of sequencing classically. Um, whole genome tends to be more than 30 fold. Today, you'll see people going for 70, 80 fold. In Genomics England, it's about 80 fold. Um, some people go to 100 fold, depending on how much money you have. Um, exome sequencing tends to exceed 100 fold coverage for the areas that are sequenced. And targeted panel sequencing really should be over 200 fold coverage. Now, that doesn't always, that's not always uh, what happens, but generally, this is what, what is um, preferred in the community. In terms of mutation types, whole genomes will cover everything. You'll get all mutation classes, subs, indels, rearrangements, and copy number. Exome sequencing and targeted panel sequencing will only get substitution and indel information. You can push the boat out to try to get copy number information. It's a little bit harder, but in general, these are the this is the, the differences between the different experimental strategies. I just want to give you a sense of scale. This is one patient and she has been sequenced by, uh, these are substitutions only, sequenced by whole genome on the left, exome in the middle, and targeted sequence. So just to give you a sense of scale, four and a half thousand substitutions by genome, 43 by exome, and one by targeted. That is the difference in scale, okay? So this is just to give you a sense of, of sort of the, the variation between a targeted sequence and a whole genome. I will come back to this in the mutational signatures section, but for now, this is just to give you an overview of the different kinds of sequencing strategies. OK, point number four is um, you'll hear these terms and I'm going to use these terms so that we get used to it. When you go from raw reads to aligned reads where you've just got this contact of the whole genome, that's called primary analysis. Secondary analysis is when you go from your aligned reads, which are your BAM files, into somatic mutations and somatic mutations are often stored as VCF files or bed PE files. I mean, I think we're trying to push the community to just use VCF files, but that's called secondary analysis. 
once you get to somatic mutations, when you want to do all your fancy stuff, find drivers, do signatures, do your phylogenetic trees, that's called tertiary or downstream analysis. So this is just to orientate you of the different levels. And when I talk through today, I will talk through each of these steps and then you go through to reporting. So just want to make sure that you've got all of those things. These are the principles. Cancer is a clonal algor growth. You understand the pr principle of an NGS procedure. You understand the principles of identifying somatic variants and the somatic variant analytical process. So this is basic knowledge. All good. Now we're going to go to the harder stuff. <laughs> OK, so um, section one, a QC of sequence data. Now, Sometimes some people don't look at this um, and I strongly suspect that when you get your uh, reports or when you get your results, you won't be looking at this, but I think it's useful for you to understand it and to know it because sometimes there are weird uh, results that come that are, are the result of some of these problems that arise at this stage. So right at this point, you've just got your sequence data. You want to know that um, the insert sizes, the size of the fragments are roughly the size that you were expecting. So here, um, this is a standard plot you would get from any of the standard alignment tools, um, and you would like to see something that peaks above 400 base pairs. Actually, you'll be surprised at how many companies don't achieve this. So do look out for that if you think your data is not quite what you were expecting. The second thing to think through is the quality of the bases in the reads. So these days we tend to have 150 base pair reads. The quality of each base in that read should be somewhere between 30 and 40. These are FRED quality scores. Um, what does that mean? So the FRED quality scores are defined as a, as a sort of a negative log of the base error probabilities, and that makes a lot of sense to a statistician, but not necessarily to a clinician. Um, I think what you can translate that to is um, a score of 40 is a probability of an incorrect base call being 1 in 10,000. A score of 30 is a probability of an incorrect base call being 1 in 1,000. That's what 30 and 40 mean. You want to see a nice flat line um, all the way from the start of the cycle to the end of the cycle, end of the 150 base pair read, always between 30 and 40. That's a lovely uh, plot up there. OK, then what about the representation of the bases in the reads? The ATGC representation. Now, the human genome has more AT than GC, roughly 60, 40. So A and T are superimposed here at 30% each, and C and G are superimposed at 20% each. And again, that should be should be uniform throughout the 150 base pair cycle. So this again is a beautiful plot. What's the sequence co coverage that you've got? Is it what you're expecting? If you've asked for 40x, then you should see a peak at about 40x. If you ask for 70x, you should see the peak a bit further along. A lot of people don't look at this sort of data, but I have to say that I do. Every single genome that comes through me, I do look at. Um, there are some additional pieces of information that you will sometimes get, which is what's the duplicate rate? Again, something that you'd like to aim for less than 20% of. Um, a lot of people just ignore this, but I find it quite quite helpful. Um, and then I think the other point is, do the tumor and normal samples match? Is there any contamination from another sample in the normal or in the tumor? Because that will affect your ability to call mutations. Again, this tends to happen behind the scenes, um, which is why I put here, it is assumed that someone has done it. You'll be amazed. Um, I think you mainly need to understand these principles if you are not looking at them. And I will come to why that is important a bit later. OK, so that's QC of sequence data. Primary analysis um, is something you just need again, just need to understand. There are there are probably two main buckets of computational approaches to align reads back to the reference genome. Those two categories are global alignments and local alignments. When you calculate a global al alignment, you're basically trying to take reads and trying to, to align the reads to the entire length of, uh, of the um, reference genome um, with as few uh, differences uh, as possible between the reads as you're going through the genome. By contrast, when you're doing local alignments, you are trying to align reads to smaller regions but you're permitting a bit more diversity between the reads that are going into that region. Local alignments probably give you more sensitive information for things like indels and rearrangements, but they're computationally heavy. And that's why for aligning the human genome, in general, people use global alignments like BWA, a BWA-MEM, that sort of thing, because it's computationally a bit less intensive. 
But later on, I will show you examples of where local alignments are used, particularly for indels and rearrangements. OK, so um, primary analysis simply takes your jumble of reads and aligns it back to the reference genome so that you've got some kind of contig. Great. OK, so that's primary analysis. You just need to understand that that just happens behind the scenes. Great. Next, secondary analysis. You've got your aligned reads. We want to call mutations. Um, we can look for substitutions, insertions and deletions, and we want to look for chromosomal abnormalities, whether they are here a duplication, a deletion of the pink bit, an inversion where the blue and pink bits inverted, or translocations when one chromosome is joined to another. These are all mutations. They're just different mutation classes. Some people think of substitutions as mutations. I don't know what they think the others are, but the others are mutations as well from, from where I'm sitting. They just that these are at base pair resolution and these are at chromosomal scale. So I'm now going to walk through the principles of how we call um, substitutions, insertions, deletions and rearrangements. These are general principles. Um, each algorithm will have its own little quirks. So don't worry about the details. Really, I mainly want you to come away with the principles. OK, so let's do substitutions first. This is probably the most advanced version of being able to call mutations, and it is largely statistical. So it's it's probably the most robust and there are probably the most options um, in terms of different callers. There's mutect, mutect to shear water, caveman. There's all sorts of different ones out there. They're all much of a muchness. They all, some of them have different strengths. Some of them have different weaknesses. Uh, but the general principle is that they use a probabilistic model often um, that takes into account the number of reads reporting the mutated allele, the variant allele, in both the tumor as well as the normal. So this is just to show you a depiction. We, I showed you these fragments of reads that have now been aligned to the reference genome. If, for example, you had a germline SNP, you've inherited a mutation from your mum or your dad, then roughly one in every two reads would have um, the um, mutation. And so the fraction of reads, the variant allele fraction, the VAF, you will hear that recurrently in cancer, the fraction of reads reporting that variant will be roughly 50%. It won't always be 50%. There will be a bit of variation because that's life, um, but it will be roughly 50%. Now, in a cancer, when you take a sample from a patient, there is no doubt that you will also capture some normal cells, stromal tissue, lymphocytes, whatever. And so some of the reads will come from a normal cell, or will come from normal cells. So there's a population of reads that's uh, basically not the tumor, and only a fraction comes from the tumor. Uh, but it's important to note then that if you had a diploid region in the genome, in your cancer, and you have an acquired mutation, then half of this fraction is still a heterozygous change, but that half is of the tumor cell population. So if here the tumor cell population is 70%, then half of 70% is 35%. Now, most of the substitution algorithms will take this sort of information into account. It will literally count the number of reads reporting the reference allele versus the mutated allele in the tumor and the normal. It will take into account that there's normal cells as well. And if it's a very good algorithm, it will also take into account ploidy. Because what I've described here is when you have a heterozygous mutation in a diploid region, but cancers are rarely diploid or so some of them are not diploid. Some of them could be tetraploid or triploid. And so when it makes the probabilistic estimate of whether something is a mutation, it will take that into account. So on the right hand side, I've given you an example where the fraction of reads reporting the mutation is only 20 percent. But in this particular algorithm, if it, it, it will say you know, it will take into account this, the number of copies of the chromosome there. So this could be uh, at a fraction of reads of 20 percent. This could be a mutation on one allele in a region which is tetraploid. So then it'll say, OK, well, actually, this is a 99% probability of being a true mutation. Or it will consider that actually perhaps it's not a tetraploid region and that mutation might be a subclonal mutation in a region that is diploid. Now, I'll give you a slightly different probability estimate, but it takes those possibilities into account. So the bottom line is that for substitution mutation calling, 
probabilistic models are used, it simply takes into account the number of reads reporting the mutant allele versus the wild type allele in both the tumor and in the normal. If, if the reads are present like this in the tumor and there are no reads in the normal that are reporting the variant, then it'll be very confident there's a mutation there. If it's like this, it'll be a bit less confident, but if it's tetraploid, it might say, actually, I am still quite confident that this is a mutation. So many of the substitution algorithms work in that way. They're probabilistic models and they're pretty sophisticated. And that's how they work. And that might have sounded rather complicated. <laughs> I hope it wasn't too bad. But anyway, the rest of them are really much more crude. So if we go now to indels, again, we have our reads. Um, so the green and red, that's a very bad combination, isn't it? Green and red. But green and red arrows are um, the forward and reverse reads. And they should be mapping um, at the right distance throughout the genome between the green and the red arrows. Now, sometimes you'll find regions where there are clusters of reads where one end maps and the other end, so the red end of the green arrows, either don't map well or don't map at all. So the algorithm is walking through the genome and it's trying to find sites in the genome where one end maps and the other one is not mapping or doesn't map well. It then takes the reads that are not mapped or not mapped well and then it does a local realignment, like I mentioned earlier. It takes those red reads and it tries to do a local realignment to see whether it can now map it with um, permissive for, for an insertion or a deletion. So you can imagine that this perhaps is not as robust a method as the substitution method. It doesn't take into account things like normal contamination and ploidy. I think some of the new world ones are trying to. There is there's less of a probabilistic element and it's a bit more crude. So indel calling tends to be more fraught with false positives and false negatives as well. So you can imagine that if, you're, if your sequencing depth isn't high enough, then you're not going to see a cluster of reads, you're just going to miss them. Um, or you might find that um, you have a cluster of reads and it's a region that's actually slightly poorly mapping and there's a whole bunch of red reads here that it tries to map and gives you some false indels. There's no probabilistic element. So that's why indel calling is not as good as substitution calling in general. Okay, rearrangements. So there is usually a two-step process. The first step is the discovery step, which is to find discordantly mapping reads. Because remember our fragment of 500 base pairs 100 base, 150 base pairs, one and 150 base pairs, the other 300 base pairs apart. That's what we are expecting. We're expecting our reads to map a certain distance apart and to map in the right orientation. Now, if the reads map at a wrong sort of distance, too far apart, too close, or if it maps in the wrong orientation or on different chromosomes altogether, then these are indications that there is a rearrangement in the region. So this is step number one, identifying discordantly mapping reads is the first step. Many algorithms stop there, and that is why you have a high rate of false positives. Because you can imagine that this actually happens quite frequently, especially in regions that are not so well documented, especially in Build 37. Build 38 is a bit, a bit different, but um, uh, in Build 37, you just get a lot of false positives. So some of the better algorithms add on further information, which is the second step. After you've found the, the um, discordantly mapping reads, you want to map it and use local realignment again, like I mentioned before, in order to map the breakpoints to base pair level. So in this first step, you're just identifying regions that have discordantly mapping reads. Now you're going to take all the reads in that region to actually map the breakpoints to base pair level. You want to know exactly what the chromosome coordinate uh, is that that breakpoint is happening. So I have to say, not all callers do this, which makes life a bit hard. Um, but I think that a second step is absolutely required to be able to get good, high quality rearrangement data. Um, so we take all of the reads. So here is a sort of a schematic drawing. This is an example um, and ten, it tends to be a little bit compute intensive. So when I say it takes all of the reads, I mean it takes um, read pairs, uh, reads that are in blue here is one chromosome that is normal. Yellow is the other chromosome that's normal. That's, let's pretend this is a translocation. And pink are the reads that span the breakpoint that actually are informative of the rearrangement. So when we do local realignment, we're going to use all of the reads 
whether or not they actually report the rearrangement. Now, often um, this is relatively compute intensive and uses sort of mathematical graph theory. So I'm just going to show you sort of a close up of the principle of, of this local reassembly. So the blue blue reads here are represent chromosome 11 and the yellow reads represent chromosome 6. These are the intact reads from the wild type um, uh, chromosome and then the pink read represents um, the, uh, the actual rearrangement. And what you're looking for is a pattern. This is sort of mathematical graph theory. I won't pretend I know all of the bits about it. This is called a De Bruijn graph. And, and it basically looks to be able to 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 map out this um, this this image, this 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 pattern of five vertices. And if it sees that consistently, then it will say, yes, I'm sure there is a breakpoint here and it maps to chromosome 11 breakpoint here, chromosome 6 breakpoint here, and in fact, there's TTA as extra sequence in between. That is a high quality rearrangement mapping process. Not all algorithms do it, admittedly, but ideally we should be trying to get to this stage. Um, it is possible, it's just, it's not as, it, again, a bit like Indels, it's not as good as the substitution mutation calling process. Um, now, I've given you a lot of information there. I think really what I want you to take home is that rearrangement um, identification is a two step process. The first step is just finding discordantly mapping reads and the second step involves local realignment um, and sometimes things like graph theory in order to map it to breakpoint level. That's really all you need to, to know and, and that some algorithms don't have that second step, which is why they're not so good. OK, I've sort of given you a kind of an insight into the principles. One of the most important things is the post hoc filtering. Once an algorithm has called all of its mutations, um, there's usually something called filtering, um, which we do to try to clean up the data. And that's because things are not as straightforward as we would like. So on the left hand side is an image of yellow is forward reads, blue is reverse reads, and you can see red is a mutation. And here all of these red dots are on on one side, but they're all only on blue reads because this is a, it's a, this is a mapping artifact. Um, but but a, a probabilistic model will walk over this and go, this is quite a high likelihood of being a mutation. <laughs> so um, if my PhD was like trying to figure out a whole bunch of these um, post hoc filters. So to give you a sense, um, on the right hand side, this is actually a, a snapshot of something from my thesis. These are the names of the samples. This is the raw calls from the algorithm. And then this is the number of mutations that failed more than one filter or that failed one filter. And the total number of somatic variants that were high quality and usable for clinical work was 3%, 8%, 9%, 5%. So if you take, I think the, what I'm trying to communicate is if you take stuff out of a mutation calling algorithm and you've got this number of mutations, you really have to ask yourself, has the post hoc filtering happened? Uh, and you should really be down to sort of small percentages of the total number. So that that is um, uh, the post hoc filtering is really quite quite um, severe, it's quite stringent. But actually, if you if you look at gel data, for example, they've done all of this for you. But I just wanted to make the point that a lot of it actually happens after the first after the, the mutation calling. So mutation calling happens, and a lot of this filtering actually happens after that. But it's terribly important. And actually everyone in the cancer genomics field would like to say their algorithm is the best. They all have strengths and weaknesses. The most important thing is of post hoc filtering actually. <laughs> anyway, so um, let's just consolidate and reflect. Um, we covered QC on sequence data. As I mentioned earlier, we assume that someone has done it. Something you just need to understand. Primary analysis is just something you need to understand. Secondary analysis is calling somatic variants. We've done subs, which is a probabilistic model usually of the number of reads. Um, of the alternative allele in tumor relative to normal. Indels identifies classes of reads where one read maps well and the other one doesn't and performs local realignment on the reads that don't. Rearrangements or structural variation identifies discordantly mapping reads and then performs complex reassembly, local reassembly to report breakpoints. And there's always post hoc processing involved. Those are the main points you just have to be aware of um, in somatic variant calling. Don't worry about the details. Everybody worries about the details, but really there's no point. OK, so that's if you got that, you're doing really well. We're going to go to copy number next. Um, and copy number profiling in cancer is very similar to 
the germline world, you use log R, which is a measure of total signal intensity, and the B allele frequency, which is a measure of allelic contrast between your A and B um, alternative alleles. Um, and using that information, just the relative presence, the relative amounts of separation between them, you can construct these plots which report the predicted aberrant cell fraction, the amount of tumour that's in the sample, versus the overall ploidy, the number of chromosomes in the cancer. Um, and um, all, the, all the algorithms do this in the background. You will probably not see them, but I find them quite useful to look at, but you will probably not see them. And what you'll find is they'll give you the result. They'll just tell you this tumour has got 65% um, tumour cellularity and has a ploidy of just under two. What, ploidy 1.88, aberrant cell fraction 65%. That's the number that you will be seeing in your report. But this is how we get to it. It's based on the same things as standard copy number, log R and B allele frequency. We make this plot. Now notice how there are several dark spots here. So this is a typical multiple solution problem in mathematics. You There's multiple potential solutions and actually choosing the right solutions is sometimes a little bit hard. But here the algorithm has said it's this one. And when it chooses this point as this is a like most likely solution for the amount of tumor and ploidy in this cancer, it will then segment the data for you and it'll give you the information about the number of copies of every single part of the genome going um, going forward. So now in, for this particular patient, it's saying um, ploidy is 1.88, aberrant cell fraction 65% and um, okay, so purple is total copy number. It doesn't, and every algorithm is going to be slightly different. But basically, this is the this is the basic information you will get. You will get total copy number, and the minor allele. Those are the two things. And I will show you the numbers shortly so that you get used to seeing the numbers. So if I just walk you through the genome here, chromosome one is um, uh, total number is two, minor allele is one. So that's typical wild type diploid. You can see one Q, there's a gain here. There's a total number is three, minor is still one. So there's a copy number gain. And chromosome four has a loss. Total number is one, minor allele is zero. So there's a whole chromosome loss there. Most of this is deployed. Okay, that may look a little bit scary, but actually it's not. Um, here's a different alternative for, but this is another patient. You can see the lowest score is this. So the predicted ploidy 3.75, aberrant cell fraction is 51%. And this is what the chromosomal, this copy number segmentation result looks like. What you will get is the aberrant cell fraction, the ploidy, and the copy number segmentation data. This information in terms of one, zeros, twos, ones, and threes, and I will show you that shortly. I'm just sharing this background information so that you have an understanding where it comes from. Don't worry if you don't you don't recognize or you don't see these plots ever again. I will show them to you, and I but I mainly want you to understand the principles. Okay. You will also see and hear people talk about normal DNA content, tumor DNA content, total DNA content, normal cell contamination. All of it can be calculated from the aberrant cell fraction and ploidy. And here are the equations for how you get them. I'm just leaving it there. You might never use them again, but actually just wanted to let you know that it's all perfectly simple to calculate. Uh, it's simple mathematics. It's just there's an equation that people just tend not to not to share with each other, but it is there. OK, I'm going to skip right over that because what I want to, to do is communicate the practical information and the practical information. So my little green person is showing up here. The practical information is this information. When you get the segmentation data, you will be told the chromosome, the coordinates start and end, the total copy number, which in here is the purple line, two, and the minor allele, which is one. So this is wild type. This basically all it means is between this coordinate and that coordinate, it is basically wild type. Great, that's easy. Then chromosome four, between that coordinate and that coordinate, the total is one and the minor allele is zero. This is loss of heterozygosity in cancer. I know LOH means something slightly different in the germline, which is slightly painful, um, but um, it simply means you've got one parental allele, the other parental allele is lost. But look out for this because this is something you will need in driver analysis later. OK, alternatives are this chromosome one, um, this position one Q basically total copy number is three, minor is one. This means it's a gain. Here's a nice example of a in chromosome five total copy number is two, minor allele is zero. This is called copy neutral LOH, which is very unhelpful as a term. 
it basically means that you have got two copies of one parental allele. So either you have two copies of the maternal allele or two copies of the paternal allele because you've lost the other um, um, wild type allele. And then the copy that was remaining has duplicated because cancers are awkward and do silly things like that. But this is what um, cancer genomicists mean by copy neutral LOH. And we'll show you some examples later. Um, so this is an amplification. Total copy number 35, minor is one, that's easy. That's a HER2 locus. Um, and then this is, which you actually can barely see, but the purple and the blue lines are overlain on each other down here. Actually, um, homozygous lesions are hard to see, but basically you'll get a total zero and a minus zero. So this, basically there's no copies of it at all. Now, the most important thing we to understand are these numbers and what they mean. So if nothing else from copy number today, this is the, this is the image, this is the information that I need you to walk away with. Okay. So um, we got up to there previously. I'm just going to add on down here. Copy number analysis gives you the aberrant cell fraction, ploidy, and the segmentation results. And at the end of all of this, this is where you are going to come in. You will have all your mutations, thousands of subs, thousands of indels, hundreds of rearrangements, and all your copy number segmentation data. It's lists and lists of this stuff. And so what you really want to do is to be able to visualize this data and put them into useful um, uh, sort of a, a sort of format so that you can look at it and go, yes, this is good data or this is bad data. And um, we are coming up with a sort of a decision support tool me mechanism to help you QC, but I think Gel is doing that too. I think there are other people who are doing similar sort of things. But this is sort of the basic things I think you need to be able to see right up front. You need to know what kind of sequencing method it is, what the coverage is, what the duplicate rate is, what are the algorithms used, what's the total number of mutations, aberrant cell fraction, employee like I mentioned before, um, and then you will get some images. So, so we like, my team like to look at these images so that we know that we have seen it all and we think these are great. So at the end of this, we tend to do a, a traffic light system, green, yellow or red. And if here we kind of look at it, and we say, yes, it all looks good. This is green. You can now report on the rest of it. And that's great. Sometimes it's yellow or, or a, a, sometimes an amber or a red, meaning we're not happy with the results. And what we're going to do in our third session is go through some examples to look at the QC together so that you learn how to go. This is fine. This is fine. This is fine. This is not good. This is not good. But all of it is based on the background that I've given you for the last 30 minutes or so. OK, so I hope that was all OK so far. I'm going to move on to tertiary analysis because we've actually done not too badly for time. Um, and um, right, so driver mutations first. Um, so why do we hunt down driver mutations? Driver mutations are causally implicated in carcinogenesis, so I was told as a student. Eventually, as we started to do single cell sequencing and normal cell sequencing, we found that driver mutations may not have caused the cancer at all or driver mutations may have contributed to cancer, but may no longer be relevant to cancer at present. All of these semantic possibilities are potentially true. Um, and actually what I found is this is the most um, lasting definition of driver mutations actually by uh, Mike Stratton et al. Driver mutations confer growth advantage on the cells carrying them and have been positively selected during the evolution of the cancer which is not quite the same thing as saying it is causally implicated in cancer, but that's how people have interpreted it over the years. But I think that's quite a good way of describing it. And the main reason we hunt down driver mutations is because it become, becomes targets for therapeutic intervention. People want to see whether you've got HER2 because that's a target for um, anti-HER2 therapies, EGFR, that sort of thing. So we're going to go through some of those examples together. Now, first point to make, there's only a handful of driver mutations in a cancer genome. One, sometimes five, maybe possibly 10, but really no more than that. But there's thousands of passenger mutations. So if you're faced with a report and you need to kind of do some curation, actually don't panic, it's not that many of them. So it's only a small number of driver mutations that actually really matter. And, and this is some examples of some of those driver mutations that you, you, you kind of need to be able to identify because there are targeted therapies for them. OK, so I'm going to cover the types of driver events that are present in cancer genomics. This is a real sort of simplification, but generally we sort of think of driver mutations as oncogenes or tumor suppressors. These are general rules and there are exceptions. 
In general, if it's an oncogene, it's something that's activating, the mutations tend to be point mutations, missense mutations. They can sometimes be indels. They can be caused by gene fusion events. And in terms of copy number, they tend to be amplifications. The number of copies increase. You only need one allele mutated. And I, that was why I was going on about the copy number, the numbers in copy number segmentation, because then you can actually tell whether sometimes a tumor suppressor actually is a driver or not. Um, so in oncogenes, you only need one allele to be mutated. For tumor suppressors, on the other hand, the mutations tend to induce like stop, they tend to be nonsense or frame shifting mutations or essential splice site mutations. Uh, they might be read throughs, um, but generally these are the kinds of mutations that are found in tumor suppressor genes. If you have rearrangements, they tend to transect or disrupt the gene or remove exons. Um, or in terms of copy number, they tend to be homozygous deletions. Now, in theory, if it's a tumor suppressor, you need to lose both alleles to be a tumor suppressor. That's terribly important because the human genome is massive. And actually, if you have a hypermutative phenotype, you could easily hit a tumor suppressor gene, but it actually be a passenger mutation and it's not a driver mutation. Um, and you really want to know whether the other allele is still intact or not. So I think it's good practice to hunt down the other allele. I know not everybody does it, but that is good practice. OK, let's just look at some of these mutations in the genes. These are across patients. This is just to give you a sense of the biology of oncogenes. PIK3CA is a very well-known oncogene. Um, it's very commonly mutated. Um, and this is sort of the, uh, the whole of the, um, uh, the proteins or the amino acids across uh, PIK3CA. This is taken from um, COSMIC, by the way, um, in, at the Sanger Institute, so you can access this very easily. And you'll find that in oncogenes, there tend to be copy number gains and overexpression. And the mutations tend to cluster. They tend to be in very specific sites. So if I show you a tumor suppressor, by contrast, the mutations tend to be across the whole gene. They tend to be a mix of different things, frame shifting, nonsense, sometimes missense. Uh, and then if you look down here, there can be copy number losses um, and they tend to be sort of, uh, they, te they tend not to have overexpression. So these are sort of two extremes of oncogenes and tumor suppressors. If you are ever in doubt, if you are looking at a mutation in a gene that you don't really recognize, because some of us don't recognize all of the genes, and you're kind of going, is this, a, is this an oncogene or tumor suppressor? Sometimes going to one of these reference sites and just looking at them and thinking it through, it'll help you figure out whether it's a, it should be an oncogene or, or a tumor suppressor. So just to, to drive the home that message, pick 3 ca I want to show you how much it clusters. So I'm just zooming into that region. These are two very well-known sites, E542K and E545K in pick 3 ca And that's another site, the H1047R. Now I've done this enough times to know these without even having to look at them, but if you're not sure, if you go to, to Cosmic, this cancer census site, you'll be able to scroll across the gene to figure out whether you think it's a it's actually a driver, an oncogenic driver or not. So it's quite a useful site to go to. OK, I said that there were exceptions. GATA3 is one of them. This is um, the GATA3 gene. Now, if you look at the distribution of mutations, it's really across the gene, isn't it? It looks more like a tumor suppressor. Um, and um, but but then you find that there's more gains than losses and it tends to be overexpressed rather than underexpressed. Now, if you look at the distribution then of the mutations in the protein um, by, by its sort of domain structure. So these are the um, transcriptional activation domains and these are two zinc finger motifs and all the mutations are clustered at one end of the protein. Uh, it's a lot of them and they're frame shifts instead of missense. So this is one of those which is a bit unusual because these are frame shifting mutations, but they are clustering. Um, but they're clustering in a very important domain and what happens is this becomes its dom dominant negative. So, so there are exceptions, um, and um, it, which makes life a little bit harder. But, but in general, if you go to the Cosmic Census website, you'll be able to get a bit of guidance as to whether you think something is an oncogene or a tumor suppressor. Now, I'm giving you a lot of this bio biological information. A good decision support tool for you to report whole cancer genomes should flag this information for you. It should say to you, this H01-1047R mutation has been seen a thousand times in breast cancer. This is almost definitely a driver mutation. And the copy number is one or two one. Or this RB1 mutation is a well-known driver. It's frame shifting and the copy number is one zero. So I'm going to show you some examples of that. So in the ideal world, your decision support tool will actually produce all that information for you so that you can just look at it and go tick. This is definitely a driver. But just in case it doesn't, I'm giving you this information, but also I think it's important for you to understand how we think when we 
interpret some of these driver events. Okay, let's do some curation together. Um, so this is um, one patient. She's got a pic 3 ca mutation. So these reads here, this is an IGV browser image. Um, that's a tumor reads and these are her normal reads. So we can see a mutation there, pic 3 ca H1047R, variant allele fraction, 40%, sounds about right. Copy number 21. Yeah, that would work for a driver mutation. Great. This is AKT1, uh, a very well-known one, E17K, variant allele fraction 0.81. That's a bit high, isn't it? Because you would have expected it to be heterozygous. Um, and then you find out that copy number is 31. So there's three alleles, not two. And it is very likely that this AKT1 ha has happened on one of the alleles, and that allele has duplicated, which is why you've got such a high variant allele fraction. So that actually does make sense now that you know what that copy number is. And so I think what I'm trying to communicate here is the discipline of looking at the mutation and then thinking about the additional information like copy number and then doing the interpretation and going, does that fit? Which is what we do in medicine. In medicine, you have the information on the ECG and the chest X-ray and the bloods and you go, does this picture fit? And that's all you're doing when you're walking through some of these. Does it make sense? If it doesn't make sense, then you know something's not right is it, or it's not a driver. Okay. So here, uh, I just did oncogenes here are tumor suppressors. This is RB1. This is a deletion. It's a frame shifting deletion. Um, and then its copy number is one zero. So the allele that's got the mutation is there. The other allele is lost. So this is a beautiful driver of a tumor suppressor gene. And here's P10, another well-known um, tumor suppressor gene. There's a frame shift event. Um, copy number is again one zero. So this is P10 frame shift with loss of the other allele. So that again makes sense. Here's another patient who's got a germ, who's actually got a BRCA1 mutation. So here it is in the germline, present at roughly 50%. And then in the tumor, it's present in all of the reads because the other allele is lost. So I hope that makes sense. That is kind of how you should be thinking if you're doing the curation. Not everybody does curation. You shouldn't need to do curation completely. It should, the, a good decision support tool will either tell you already this is definitely a driver or this has been seen before, or if you're not sure, you should be able to click on a link that sends you to the IGV browser so that you can quickly look at it to sanity check it. Okay, let's go to some other examples, structural variation and rearrangements. So this is a BRCA2 X13, that's X13. Um, it's been deleted. So this uh, is a large deletion of X13. So it's transected the gene and then you can actually see the reads here. So you can see a reduction of reads there, but you can see a dip there. So there's also LOH for the other allele. So this is a really nice example of a bracket two structural deletion in one allele and LOH actually visible on the other allele. So I think the other point I'm trying to communicate here is when you're looking at the reads, look, take, take a, um, a zoom out version as well. Look wider because sometimes it's just there for you. It's a beautiful example, this one. Um, okay, um, this is another um, uh, example for structural variation, P10. Here we have got a, um, uh, a dele again, a big deletion here. Um, uh, but what the copy number information, the other useful information is telling you it's two zeros. This is copy neutral LOH that I mentioned earlier. So you have, what's happened is there's there's two parental, there were, there were two parental alleles. And then actually I've got the drawing here. There were two parental alleles. And then let's say on the paternal allele, there has been a this big deletion, which is this thing here. You've lost the other allele. That This one that's remaining has duplicated. So that's why you've got such a large number of, or large region and large number of reads missing um, the, the, the multi-exon deletion. Okay, so that was just me kind of giving you an example of um, some of the structural variation. Uh, now I want to end on some of the amplifications and homozygous deletions. So amplifications, um, gene amplification is a copy number increase of a very restricted region in the chromosomal arm. It is prevalent in, in certain tumor types and, and tends to be associated with overexpression of amplified genes. Now, amplified DNA can be organized. Uh, on the copy number plot, you're just say, getting a sense of the total number. Where those pieces of DNA has gone can vary, and they can go to little like double minute or so extra chromosomal DNA. They can be arranged in sort of tandem arrays um, scattered on, on the same chromosome, but sort of added on, as it were, or they can be like distributed and scattered anywhere in the genome. So you don't get this information when you're looking at 
the whole genome data or even copy number data, uh, you'd have to do additional inform um, fish or whatever to try to find the, the physical location. All you're getting when you're looking at the copy number result is that there is an amplification and actually that's all you need. Now, in the literature, this can be a little bit daunting because these are all the amplifications or many of the amplifications that have been reported. This was a recent one from TCGA. Um, I don't know, I don't find it particularly useful. There's just so many of them. For you, what you need to be able to report are regions of the genome that have a copy number that's nine or above if your overall ploidy of your whole genome is less than five. So if, the, if your overall ploidy is less than five and you've got a copy number increase that's nine or more, you need to be alert to whether that might be an amplification. And why? Because some of those tend to be targetable or are used for prognostication. Not all of them. So, you know, I think what I want to communicate is there are certain ones you really mustn't miss. So MIC, please don't miss that. RB2, please don't miss that. That TCND1, CCND1, MDM2, MICN for neuroblastoma, EGFR for treatments um, in lung cancers. I'm sure this list is longer depending on what your favorite tumor type is. So this is by no means an exhaustive li list. What I'm trying to say is amplifications should be detectable. Um, and um, they, they are definitely ones that you really don't want to miss. So if, if in doubt, look hard, <laughs> zoom in, look at the, do a bit of curation. And here is a nice example of a bit of curation where there's a 29x amplification of HER2. Um, zoom out is the other thing. Don't just look at it like this. Play with it and look out a little bit to see what that might show you, because then, you know, in some other ones you look, you zoom out and there's bang, a 33X amplification of HER2. It tends to hit you in the face. If you miss it, it's bad. So don't miss amplifications. OK, I noticed I've only got 10 more minutes left. So homozygous deletions are um, when you have big chunks of um, the genome that are completely missing. Both alleles are missing. So the total number is zero and the minor allele is also zero. These again tend to happen in tumor suppressor genes, not surprisingly, um, and they look a bit like this. So um, this is an example in an ovarian cancer of an RB1 homozygous deletion. These are easy to spot in theory. If you've got good copy number data, the numbers will tell you. So it will be total number zero, my, total, total tumor zero, and total minor zero. Um, and again, if you've got a good decision support tool, it will report that information to you. It will highlight all the zero, zero um, copy number regions and say these are possible homozygous deletion regions. Now, some tumors will have this, but there's no genes in the region, then maybe it doesn't do anything. But if it hits something like RB1 or P10 or CDKN2A, then you really want to report it. OK, so um, I just want to make sure that I've driven home this message about curation. Look at it, get useful information like copy number, and then think through the interpretation. Does it fit? OK, it's like medicine. Does it fit? Does all of it come together? And remember, there's not too many to do per cancer. I know that seems terrifying, but actually it's not. And most of the time, a good decision supporter will have done it for you. You won't. You shouldn't. And after we have collected you know, thousands of genomes over time, you shouldn't have to do too much curation going forward. But I'm just trying to teach you how to think it through so that you understand it. Last but not least is gene fusions. Um, these can happen through translocations, they can happen through inversions or through deletions, and they often bring um, two genes in apposition or sometimes sort of a promoter of one gene or some kind of enhancer region together with another oncogene. Um, these are some classical descriptions. Um, again, here, this is just another image of some of the uh, many of the different um, gene fusions that are present in particular cancer types you'll find that some cancer types report a lot of gene fusions and some cancer types really don't. So very interesting, prostate, these are sort of the list of gene fusions that have been reported for it. Lung cancers, this is um, uh, in some of the uh, um, uh, hematological cancers and here's papillary thyroid sarcoma, um, ALL and CML. But there are other ones like breast cancer, there's only one. Um, and then the rest of them, you know, you don't really have this sort of list of common recurrent gene fusions. Again, a good um, decision support tool will probably say to you, this has been reported before thousands of times in prostate cancers is very likely to be a gene fusion event. Now, um, gene fusion events because of next generation sequencing, 
every time two genes come together, some algorithms will say it's a gene fusion, but actually you need to also know whether it is in, in frame. So when you bring two genes together, if the protein is not in frame, it's not going to be a gene fusion event that's doing anything. So um, a good decision support tool or a good uh, pipeline will say to you, um, this is temperate to an erg and it is in frame, so it's predicted to be a gene fusion. So actually, um, the total number of potential gene fusions and actually real gene fusions tend to be quite different. Um, and why are they important to find? Well, it's because there are specific drugs that are targeted to them. So this is sort of a list of and with drugs that have been approved for certain gene fusions. This is sort of our team's list. Everyone's got a slightly different list, which is a little bit unhelpful. And I don't really want to be sharing lists um, because I think that you will get that guidance directly either from Genomics England or from your, your local GMS or whatever. But th these lists are a little bit dynamic. They do change. Um, and so it's not it's not about uh, it's not about what's yeah, what's in the list will change. So as long as you know what version you're looking at and you are, um, you, you know, in, within your domain or within your GMS, you're using the same ones, then then that, that should be OK. But understanding that there will be a little bit of variation from one site to another. OK, so I think that um, I'm going to do a bit of consolidation now. We covered driver mutations. You need to understand the difference between oncogenes and tumor suppressors. You need to be able to identify drivers from subs, indels, rearrangements, which are either transactions or gene fusions, and then copy number aberrations, whether amplifications or homozygous deletions. These should be reported with allelic status. A good decision support tool will highlight information such as whether it has been reported before um, and, um, and hopefully will help to link through to things like IGV if you really needed to curate it. And I've put here curation, which I've sort of slightly gone through there. I don't think it's required for everything. And after you've done a few, you know, you'll kind of get a feel of what what you you know new things you need to curate and old things you kind of know about. You don't really need to look at. Okay, so uh, just to reinforce at the end of the day, in terms of numbers of drivers, it's small per patient. If you're getting ten or fifteen or twenty drivers, you've probably got too many. It it tends to be small numbers. Okay, it's not every mutation in all the cancer genes um, are drivers. They're not, as only some of them are. And, and that is information that is very specific to the kind of biology. So if it's a tumor suppressor, it's going to be frame shifting or nonsense. But if it's an oncogene, it's going to be very specific uh, hotspots, clustered, clustered mutations. So just, just to drive the message home, not 50 drivers, not 100 drivers, five maybe. It's going to be small numbers. Um, I didn't touch on germline mutations at all. Of course, germline mutations matter, but I'm kind of hoping that someone else has covered that in one of your other um, se sessions. So I'm sort of conscious I've got what, three minutes left. I'm just going to say that we tend to look for driver mutations, um, but of course, the number of those driver mutations that are actually actionable, that you can do something about, it's actually terribly small. Um, and so, you know, the, I guess what you mustn't do is miss any of the actionable stuff. And again, as I said, it's very small. Um, and um, this list, you know, you can get this sort of information from Genomics England. You can get it from from sites like Cosmic, um, and they are, you know, they get this information from literature, from journals, from conferences, from the FDA. So the list of actionable mutations may be slightly different between the US and the UK. Just bear that in mind. Um, and um, but you know, sites like the Cos Cosmic site, they're very, very comprehensive, and there's a lot of information to support the stuff that they do do present. OK, so I'm sort of conscious that we've only got another three or four minutes more. Um, I'm happy to stop there, Kate, and um, and sort of push the next bit into uh, the next lecture because it's on cancer evolution, but it's actually um, not something that you guys need to necessarily know too much about. But I think I think I'll stop there because I think I've given quite a lot of information today. So um, yeah, I'll. I'll stop and take any questions if that's if, does that make sense? That, that, that's absolutely wonderful, Srila. That was the most incredible overview. Thank you so much. I enjoyed that last hour enormously, I have to say. Um, a few people have asked about recording and thank you very much for giving us permission to record uh, this session. It will be posted on the Genomics Education Programme website at the end of the series of, of three talks that Serena is very kindly giving. Now, I think we have just time for one question that someone has posted in the Q&A. Um, so Serena, does uh, whole genome sequencing analysis cover DNA, RNA and epigenetic change? 
i.e. is it a comp comprehensive assessment of the entire genome? So the stuff I've shown you today and talked about today is entirely genomic. It's completely 100% genomic focused. Many of the principles can also be applied to transcriptomics as well. So, you know, you would, there's still alignment, they're still being able to call um, mutations. You can call mutations in transcriptomics. In transcriptomics, you want to know what the relative numbers of uh, the re relative expression of the different genes are. So there are additional components of tr transcriptomics that are not captured by what I've spoke about, spoken about today. And, and what I didn't cover today is epigenetics at all. No, so this is entirely, you know, how to read a genome in terms of, of DNA. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that clarification. So. Uh, I'm going to leave the other two questions there in that that person's um, question for the next time. We can come back okay. to it then. Um, I think as it's 2.15, we should wrap up now with uh, another sincere and enormous thank you. I mean, that, that really, as I said, was the most fantastic session. And to remind everyone that we will be coming back again the same times next week. So between 1.15 and 2.15. And uh, so looking forward to it, Serena. Thank okay. you so much again, and I hope everyone else can join us again. There's a new Eventbrite link uh, for next week, so please make sure that you register and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in a week's time. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. you very much, Serena. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks. Bye. Bye.